Okay, so today uh, I plan on going over a bit about the Sudoku problem, right? So uh, if you remember, we have um, essentially two problems in our recursion assignment, which are the, um, it's probably turn on projector. So, uh, we have two problems in our, in our homework assignment. The Sudoku, basically taking, doing one of the chess problems and then doing Sudoku. Um, I also highly urge you that you solve these by yourself as best you can without relying on anything necessarily from the internet, because the A Queen's problem has been given as basically a computer science uh, homework for as long as computer science had homework. So, you know, but despite that, and despite that, I don't want to deprive you of the experience of solving this problem. Sudoku is similar. There's been lots of uh, different solutions to Sudoku, and I think it's just a valuable experience to be able to go through and solve it. So I figured I'd go over the algorithm for solving it. If you could hit the lights on back there, that would be awesome. And let me just turn on the light over, or turn down the light over here. Um, also, if you didn't get my email last night, I've got personal matters to attend to today. So I won't be able to do office hours if this completely messes up your plans. Um, I really like the score bunny attached to your uh, to your to your um, backpack. It's really cute. Um, makes me wish I had one. All right. So the um, the I have personal matters to attend to. Uh, so if you if this messes you up your plans for office hours, just please send me an email and I'll meet with you like either really late tonight or sometime tomorrow. Okay. I've just got you know. I've just got things to, to do today. And um, yeah, I mean, the other class is getting a pre-recorded lecture, so. All right, so Sudoku, there is basically, um, so Sudoku follows the same kind of general algorithm we've been see seeing, which is basically that we are given a position on the board as an argument. Now, now that's also something that basically that I have that students have some issue with, by the way, is that they do not uh, put a position on the board. So um, let me just go ahead and share my screen so that people on Zoom can see it. So, right, doesn't, so Java, let's do it. So for Sudoku, you want your argument to look, you want your, a lot of times I get students who just basically give the solve method and then they pass in the board, which is an integer array. And then they look for the position that they're at. That's not what I want you to do with that problem. What I want you to do for Sudoku is I want you to pass in the board, yes. And, and this should return a Boolean. But I should, but I also want you to give, I also want you to take in like int row, and your column. You should always pass in what your position is, which is basically what square I am currently trying to solve. Okay. Now, how do you know what? Now, you're going to be given a board, and there's a couple of com there's a couple of different possibilities when uh, for a particular row column that you're trying to solve. Right. First possibility is it's already filled. In which case, just go on to the next one. Right. Uh, and the way you do that is just simply return solving the next one. Okay. Um, you might be out of bounds, right? You might get called and it might be out of bounds, which is actually a feature, not a bug. Um, if you're out of bounds on, on your row, just simply, so if you're out of bounds on the column, just simply that means you got to the last column and you, and you were able to put something down successfully. So reset the column to one and go to the next row. If that makes sense, and then after, and then you can keep going, okay. And then if you got into the last row, congratulations, you're done. You kind of hit your base case there. So otherwise, you're in a blank square. So let's go ahead and just I will go to Canvas and pull up the algorithm because I realized, huh, you may not have it memorized like I do, okay, or you may not have had the chance to look at it because you've been busy working on an exam. A second, it's going to call me because Temple still wants to know that I am me and not some imposter. 
By the way, any idea why the why the fire alarm went off in the uh, or the emergency alarm went off in uh, Cirque about tw uh, twenty minutes ago? Because I was in there and I had no idea, and I, I was told to skedaddle because an emergency had been declared. So, well, apparently it was just that building. So I'll find out later. All right. Recursion. Okay. So again, ah, doesn't render well when it's in that. Okay, open with Firefox. There we go. All right. So this is the algorithm you will be using for both puzzles. Because basically, you pass in the salt, the board, and the salt. That should look familiar. It's pseudocode, right? So you give your position. If the position says that you're not, there's nothing left to solve, return true. And then what you do is you go through every single possible choice for that position. And if it's a valid choice, then you say, ah, oh, that's my choice. And then I go, and then I recurse going on to the next square. That is this magical phrase right here, which is gonna be the bit that's possibly hard, hard for you to understand, which is that it calls, it calls solve on itself, but on the next position. Just a reminder to keep your mask. Yep. So, so you want to go to the next position. Now, what do the trues and falses mean? The trues basically mean if you return true, that means we got a full solution. Somebody down the chain of calls got to the end. And so it returned true to me, which means I'm going to pass true back, which means that whoever called me is going to pass true back, which means that whoever called me is going to pass true back. Okay, but what does return false mean? It means backtrack. So if we look over here, we see for each possible choice, we go through each possible choice. If none of them are valid, so we have this valid function in here. If none of those choices are valid, then we, then, then we were in a dead end position. Somebody led us astray. Somebody basically led us down a dead end path. So we need to back up somewhere. So we return false to say whoever called us, which would have been done right here, right? Would have been done right here. We say, uh-uh, that's no good. You need to basically back up. You need to, that was not, that was, it may have been a valid choice, but it led you to a dead end. So you need to try something else. And that's how the recursion essentially works there, okay? And now, and what I'll show you is I'll show you in action how that looks. So for this puzzle, it essentially looks like this. We're gonna start in the top left. So we're not gonna bother using logic to solve this. We're gonna use recursive backtracking. Okay, so I'm gonna start in the top left corner. Uh, that's filled, so go on to the next call. That's filled, go on to the next call. That's empty, so let's try putting, so let me go through all possible choices. One won't work for multiple reasons. Because remember, for Sudoku, it's got to be you. Own, numbers can only appear once in the same row, the same column, and the same three by three square. Okay, so we've got a conflict already. So what about two? Same. Three won't work. Four won't work. Five won't work. Six, seven, eight. Okay, eight will work. So that was the first thing I found that worked. So I'm going to go on to the next square. Okay, I'm going to call recursively solve calling on the next square. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven worked there. One, two, three, four. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, four. Four worked there. And then one, two. So this was this was full. This was full. So go on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So right, we went through all these possibilities and we had a conflict for every single one of them, right? That meant that that one that won't work so we return false which returns false which returns false oh somebody returned false to me oh no so i guess i got to go on to the next possible choice which was five five won't work six won't work seven won't work eight won't work nine won't work ah i gotta go back up okay so eight won't work nine works one two three four five four aha one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven work. Yay. Okay. Moving on to the next column. So then, so we go, so we go to the next column. Oh, there's no more column. There's no next column. So let's go to the next row and start column at zero. 
full. This is full. This is full. This is not full. One, two, three, four, five, four. Aha. Six. Three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh no, I have to backtrack. Nine. Oh no, I have to backtrack. Eight, nine. Oh no, I have to backtrack. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Aha, go forward. Yes. How does the previous position know where it stopped? Because whoever called it, because, because, because we're doing it recursively. So whenever, so every square knows what it's trying to solve, right? Every meth, every square has its own solve method that's being called on it, essentially. So, um, so it knows because that is the position that's been passed to it. And that doesn't change, even though it's because it will go past the next position to the next square. It's not going to change. The, you see, so I'm calling it. So when I'm doing this solution, I'm calling it on the next square. One, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So call this square, which calls this square with its own position. So if this method terminates, then this method will terminate and pass back to this method, which is still right here. So in your, in, in in Java, there's there's an implicit st a call stack where basically, if you call, which basically remind tell lets the code know where it is and what the variables are. Okay, this stack is fairly large, but basically what ha this is where basically when you create stuff like integers that's stored in the stack or in a frame in the stack. Okay, and your textbook goes into a bit more detail about this. Where it's stored in the frame of the stack, and it also has what function called this method, so that when the method is done, it can return to where where the execution of the code was. Right? Remember, it's like if when you're in main, you know, you call method, and it returns, and you pick up where you left off. You don't start at the beginning of main. That's how it, that's how it knows, and it also remembers what the variables were when you when you were calling. That's what's going on over here. Okay. Um, now this stack is not an unlimited amount of space. In fact, if you um, if you basically just keep recursing and recursing, and just do so without limit, you're actually going to hit a limit, and you'll get an exception, a stack overflow exception, which means that the stack, the runtime stack, had too many method calls. You dug too deep into recursion. And so it gave you an error and because you were just eating up memory like nobody's business. And so it stopped. Uh, this can happen. I think I like I've tested on computers. This is like 4,000 calls deep. So not something to, you're going to really worry about. Basically, this is 4,000 method calls deep. That's pretty deep uh, for recursion. Um, but I mean, so so it is possible with recursion that that can happen. Yes. Just out of curiosity, how is that number generated? Why? Uh, whatever the memory limit is in the stack, because everything does take up memory. Every method call and keeping track of where it is, and keeping track of the variables in the recursive method calls, that takes up memory, and there's a certain amount of memory that's been allocated in the stack space for that. So seven, eight. Nine, sorry, seven. We're here, and then we keep going on until until we get to a solution at the end. Okay. Um, now, for a simple puzzle like this, it will basically, you know, not require too much in the way of backtracking. Uh, these puzzles that are are hard are set up that basically that if you try it like to do this, you're going to require a lot of backtracking. If there's a, and even if you try to solve it logically, there's a lot of basically, you know, okay, if I do this, then that's going to set this variable to this and set this square to this. So, um, regardless, what you're going to want to do is uh, to test your method on a Sudoku puzzle, you will want to basically, you know, copy in a bunch of zeros and these numbers to create a, um, you know, just copy in a puzzle from real life. 
uh, will take you about a minute to write it, a minute or two minutes to write it down. Tedious, I know, but I think you'll survive. Um, yes. Uh, it's the same link for office hours. Um, it is, um, it's, um, and if you can't find it there, you can find it in the Zoom link on Discord. And it's also on the front page of Canvas right below my picture. Okay, so I am recording it too. So, um, so with regards to the, um, All right, so let's see recursion, runtime stack, solving this. Right. So once you, so I said, so regardless, I recommend you work on the eight queens problem first. Now, for the eight queens problem, your solve method is going to look more like this, assuming you can spell um, like I can't. Uh, Boolean solve int board. And then rather than giving me a position, rather than giving me like a row and column, just give me a column. Now, why is that? Well, if we're solving the eight queens problem, right? We know because of the way that queens can be positioned, there can only be one queen per column. So my choice now, so my position can be my column and my choice can be what row am I gonna put my queen on? If that makes any sense, right? So, Basically, you start on column A and you go, okay, which row am I going to put my queen on? Oh, okay, I'm going to put my queen here. Okay, column B, where am I going to put my queen? Can't put it here, can't put it here because queens attack horizontally, diagonally, and vertically. So can't put it here, can't put it here. So I'll put my first queen there. I have a video, right? Um, so I have a pretty good i have a video that goes into pretty good detail about this um that i highly recommend you watch because i did put a lot of effort into it we did it kind of at the last minute of my recording session of the recording session um and there was no script involved so i'm impressed with how i, I like to pat myself on the back at least about with how well that came out so um but it's right over here with the Towers of Hanoi demo and the recursive backtracking overview. There's also recordings for both the doing the chess homework, chess homework and the Sudoku, which kind of explains what I did here. But you know, those are a bit longer videos. But um, Towers of Hanoi, that is um, something we might do as an in-class exercise on Thursday, just kind of to show you how that works. Um, now that we give everybody the chance to work on it and then this goes over the eight queens but in a kind of four by four format rather than an eight format so a four queens problem if you will because that's a lot that's a lot simpler of a problem to solve um so if you can see we it worked out pretty well um now the other thing i would mention about eight queens if you want to have fun with it you can you can instead of making it an eight queens problem you can make it an n queens problem and make it n by n if you want to um now as far as sudoku is concerned you might think that's a lot of fun to make that n by n problem but there's a funny thing about sudoku it's what we call an np complete problem okay so this may be their first time hearing that term for those of you who this is your not first time hearing the term np complete what is np complete as best you can. Can solve it in polynomial time, but you can verify solution in polynomial time? Yes. NP complete means non-deterministic polynomial, which means if I have a non-deterministic computer, I can solve it in polynomial time, but I don't have one. So I have to solve it in. So it's not able to be solved in polynomial time. Um, but you can check it in polynomial time. Basically, we have two. Basically, there's this um, big computation. There's all these computational complexity classes. There's polynomial time. Okay, polynomial time is all those basically anything that's like, uh, you know, um, big O n to the 
you know, n to the second power, n to the third power, n to the fourth power, n to the fifth power. Those are all polynomial times. Those get pretty bad. Linear is technically a polynomial. I guess you could say it's a polynomial time since it's n to the one. But the point being is that it's n to the something, right? Um, n log linear, I'd say, which is n log n, I'd say that's fine. We could put, throw that in there too, because that's somewhere between n and n, n squared. But the point being is that polynomial time is fast, relatively speaking. Not, however, the problems in, in what we classify as NP, non-deterministic polynomial, basically require that we need to solve these things in uh, something like factorial time or you have to go through all possible permutations, which means you have to do n to the n. Sorry, all possible combinations, I would say at that point, because you could do with repetition if it's n to the n. Um, but typically it's more something along the lines of n vectorial where you have to solve all possible permutations. There's some optimizations that can be done because a lot of these problems are cool in, MP, in, 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 in class MP. Like uh, the traveling salesperson problem. Traveling salesperson, Let's get the whiteboard up, shall we? Because this is important. You're not really, and, and otherwise you're gonna be limited to your exposure in this. Um, so we're, so traveling salesperson problem. I've got a city A over here, a city B over here, a city C, D, and et cetera, et cetera. And basically they can fly to any, from any city to any other city because they're all major airport hubs, right? Make sense? Now, if you've ever looked for airline tickets, you know, you may know that, okay, if I go to A to B and then B to C, that might be more expensive than me going from A to C and then A to B. Sorry, A to C and then C to B, right? So this route might be more expensive than say this route, right? So I can fly to any of those. So, uh, and remember, I can, since these are all major airport hubs, I can fly to any of them. The traveling salesperson problem says, I need to go and visit all these cities to sell my product. What is the cheapest route? What is the cheapest route to hit all, the, all, all of them? Find the shortest path that hits all of them, okay? Um, this requires you to actually, and this pretty much requires you to check every single combination, right? Every single possible of these paths, right? to see what the cheapest one is, right? That's the traveling salesperson problem. Um, yes? But we can't be located in any of those cities from the start. Yeah. I mean, even if you, even if you have a, a distinct start and end point, right? If you start at one, have to start at one city and have to start in another city, that just simply means that you're, that it becomes N minus two factorial, right? So not, not to, you're completely correct, but it's still, you know, it's still, so we just simply classify it as that. Um, so this is a big problem. Um, now, this is an MP complete problem. And what it turns out is that any problem that we, now, as it turns out, a bunch of these problems are NP complete. And what does that mean? They're, they're, if they're all NP complete, What's really cool is that we can is that they can all be transformed into one another. So Sudoku can actually be transformed into this problem, uh, as can solving a Mario level or something called preset, which is a logic satisfiability problem. There's a huge list of NP complete problems. Okay, so and that they can all be transformed into into one versus another. This is three set which is a Boolean or satisfiability, which satisfy, which asks you to say, hey, can you find some uh, basically condition that makes this logical statement true? Um, there's Hamiltonian path problem, the knapsack problem. You are a burglar trying to basically burgle somebody and you have basically all these items of value. You have some gems, you have some stacks of money, but you have a backpack and you got to fill everything in your backpack because you need your hands free so that you can make your escape, you know? So your backpack can only hold so much or so much weight, right? There's some, some amount of capacity you can carry away with you and each item has a certain amount of value. So the knapsack problem is maximize your burglary, okay? Try to figure out how much money, can, how much can I get away with, right? 
I like the burglary bit because it makes it a more interesting story, but it doesn't have to be burglary. It's literally how much, you know, how can I maximize my packet, right? And typically the, here with burglary, it's easy to think about like value allocation, okay? Um, these are actually all the same problem. And specifically what makes them interesting is that they are, uh, they're all the same problem in the sense that we can, is that if I, is that you can create a transformation from one to another, right? If you can transform an, an, an existing NP complete problem into another problem, that, that, sec, another, that other problem is NP complete. So if I can solve one, I can solve them all, which is pretty cool. So now, as you said, not what makes them NP complete is the fact that also that they are, is that they are hard to solve they all take n log n to solve. They all take that n factorial time to solve. Okay, or something like that, something in a horrible class. But they all take. But they're all easy to verify. Think about Sudoku for a second, right? Easy for me to check to see if um, if I have a uh, if something is valid or not, right? Easy for me to see is something valid. Uh, so, like, I can just simply check. Okay, there's nothing repeated in any of the rows, nothing repeated in any of the columns, nothing repeated in any of the three by threes. Actually, solving that takes more time, right? But checking to see, hey, here's my completed puzzle. Is it correct? That's much quicker to verify. Um, so, that's pretty cool. Now, what we don't know is that we do not know. We've never been able to prove one way or the other, these NP complete problems, okay? Whether or not are NP complete problems in polynomial time, are they polynomial uh, problems that just haven't been solved yet? Like, is there a polynomial solution to these problems that we just have, that nobody's just been clever enough to find? Or are these problems impossible, you know, uh, is it, are these, you know, squarely non-deterministic polynomials? You have to use an exponential time to solve them, right? Uh, we've not been able to prove that on one way or the other, right? Mathematically speaking, we've been able to, we've been banging our heads against trying to find a better algorithm. We haven't found one, but nobody's been able to prove that it's impossible yet, okay? Uh, and there's a standing millennium prize for that. That's a million dollars if you can solve uh, uh, P versus NP, prove it one way or the other, okay? If you want to learn more about this, computer automata is the class to take, or computational automata, or automata theory. Um, but it is one of those problems. Yeah, Clay, sorry, it's not Millennium's Clay Mathematics Prize uh, for that. Oh no, Millennium Prize problem. So I was right. Okay. So the point being is that it is a hard problem, and for right now, just simply, it's one of those ways of knowing, like, if your problem is NP complete, if your boss asking you to solve it, you can basically say, yeah, it will work, just not if our problem, but not if our problem size gets too big, right? Like Sudoku, we can solve that because it's not too big, but what makes it NP complete is that if I make it, like, instead of being a 9 by 9, it's a 16 by 16 or a 25 by 25. And then, and so the computational complexity of those gets up, it goes up dramatically. Okay. So that's how it becomes. So that's what I mean by NP complete. So anyway, sorry. So that was an interesting segue, I'm sure. But um, going back to what you need to do to solve the, these problems, these so similarly, eight queens and solve. They use this. Sorry, they both use the same solve algorithm. They're both uh, use the same kind of format. They both use basically this format over here. So notice that we they both have a valid function. That's going to be bit, a bit different than uh, for, each th for each thing. So for your queen, basically, you're going to want to check to make sure, okay, if I'm putting in a, a, a piece down, is it in conflict with any other piece? Okay. Now, just to give you a bit of a to ease your thinking a bit, if we put down a queen, right? Or you flew this time, queens can move in eight directions, right? You're thinking, okay, I have to check all eight directions, right? To check to see if I'm attacking it, it basically if there's somebody in the same row, the same column, or the same diagonal. And what you're wanting to do is radiate out in each direction you want to check. 
but you don't need to check all eight directions because of some enforcements we're putting in, right? First off, we're putting in one queen per column, right? So you're never gonna put more than one queen, so we don't have to test these, okay? Furthermore, with the recursive way we're solving this, we're solving it from left to right. We're always going from one column, then to the next column, then to the next column, then to the next one. We're not jumping around anywhere. And then if we hit a dead end, we're, we're backing up. We remove the piece and we back up. So there's never going to be any pieces to the right of me because that's where future pieces are going to go. Check these directions either. So I'll have to check are these directions over here. Just check if there's a, somebody in the same upper diagonal, same left diagonal, or same right diagonal. Now, you do not need nested loops to do any of these. Okay, you do not need nested loops to check, even though you're going up in like two directions. You don't need that. What I highly recommend when you write your for loop is to do something that you've never done before, which is that when you write a for loop, um, right, you can act. So your for loop basically has that standard int i is equal to zero. I recommend putting that in and doing i plus plus. Okay. And then just like doing like row plus i, row minus i as need be, right? So you're radiating out from your row column that you're looking at. But over here, this is a Boolean statement. And that means you can do anything you want. That's so long as it's a Boolean. Okay. You may not have thought about that before because typically you just do like while i is less than x or, you know, while i is less than a certain amount. But there's nothing for stopping you from making that more interesting or more powerful. Like for instance, while rho minus i is less is greater than this and something else. So you can put in an and statement. In fact, putting in an and is a key to keeping it simple over here. So you try making use of an and statement if you have to check two directions at once. And you can do that because remember, with diagonals, you're going to be going up the same amount you're going over, right? So that's that. So also, when you do your val, when you write your is valid function, or whatever you're going to call it, and you take in your board, and your row, and your column, and whatever else you need, whatever. Okay, for the eight queens problem, what you're going to probably want to do is like is just make that a single line and say return like is row valid, right? And is column valid and, and so on and so forth. So split up those checks into different functions, right? Checking the row, checking the columns and checking the diagonal or whatever as need be. Oh, well, for chess, you wouldn't need to check the same column as yourself, but in Sudoku you would, right? But basically each kind of check to see if something could go wrong, I'd put that in a different function. Why? Uh, because it allows you to basically make sure your recursion is working first. So for instance, uh, I would start out with just simply when you're writing this program, just to make sure it works. I do write your is valid, but I just simply write it as return uh, true so that every square is valid. Now, if you do that for your eight queens problem, that essentially means that, you know, in your chessboard, right, if this is the top row, you're going to get a queen here and a queen here and a queen here and a queen here and a queen, you know, all across the top. But if it does, if it gives you an output like that, that means the recursion's working, right? So now you can then focus on the more important things. And then what I would say, okay, make sure that there's only one queen per a row, like this. And so then your output would, uh, an eight rooks problem if you're familiar with chess. And so then that would be like queen and then a queen, and then it would just go across the diagonal. Make sense? And then after that, try to implement the diagonal so that they work, right? So basically make sure your recursion is running first, then check your um, your other your other, you know, your other, you know, all the directions for validity. And that will make it a bit easier to solve. Okay. So I think I've yammered on enough. Um, any other questions about this? Any uh, any other kind of question about like that I can help elucidate? 
about these problems. These are rather fun because they're puzzles, you know, um, and they're worth solving. And that's that. I'm going to go ahead and terminate this. And nobody. Okay.